Gracious and loving God, may only your words be spoken. May only your words be heard. Amen. In her book, The Dream of God, Verna Doja writes, quote, The important question to ask is not, what do you believe, but what difference does it make that you believe? Does the world come nearer to the dream of God because of what you believe? Belief is a tricky thing. Many of us come to this place this morning with various understandings of what it means to say, I believe, or even we believe, as we do every time we say the Nicene Creed. What does it mean to believe? And what does it mean that you believe? Why do we even need to say the Creed? as I was asked recently after church, and not for the first time. Well, there are a great many reasons we say the creed, and there are a great many reasons we say the creed that we do. The creed we say every Sunday was born of the council at Nicaea in the year 325, and amended in 381 at the council at Constantinople. It was agreed at the time that this creed would never be changed, standing as a hymn of unity among Christians the world over. Though the church would split between East and West in 1054, and despite further divisions and reformations, this creed has remained for many Christians a unifying cornerstone of our shared roots. The creed, as we say it each Sunday, is a hymn being sung by our siblings in Christ the world over. Friends, that means that the creed we will say in just a few minutes is the same creed that was said earlier this morning in the subway tunnels and bomb shelters of Ukraine. That, for me, is reason enough to say it. We could talk about the difference between saying, we believe in, and I believe that. We believe. Not each one of us all the time, but as a collective body of Christ, we believe together in one God, in Jesus Christ, in the Holy Spirit. Believing in is not the same thing as believing that. Believing in is giving ourselves over to relationship. It's dynamic. It's something we do with our very bodies. Believing that, however, is the territory only of the mind, the intellect, or opinion. Think for a moment of the difference between saying that you believe in someone and that you believe that something. We believe in. We give our hearts to. In the readings from Scripture this morning, we are given multiple examples of the difference between believing in something and believing that something. In the readings from Deuteronomy, in the Psalm, in Paul's letter to the Romans, and in Luke's Gospel, we are shown that believing in God ought to lead to behavior that demonstrates that belief. I ought to make a difference, what we believe, ought to make a difference in our lives. 
to even say that we believe. In Deuteronomy, the Israelites are told how to respond to their belief that God delivered them, brought them out of slavery and into the land that was promised to them. Because they believe in that God who delivered them, they are to give the first fruits of the land away. If they believe that God delivered them with, quote, a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, they ought to act like it by doing the same to those who are now suffering around them. In his letter to the church at Rome, the Apostle Paul illustrates this point by writing that what we confess with our mouths is to be believed in our hearts. What we say directs the actions of our hearts. At least, it ought to. And in Luke's story of Jesus' time in the desert, there are three at least temptations. We are told that there were many more, but we're given three. The devil tempts Jesus by reminding him that if he wishes, he can have bread like that to quench his hunger. He can have power like that to escape his vulnerability, and he can have certainty like that to extinguish any doubt. Jesus responds to each of these temptations with a confession of what he believes in, reciting back three different verses from Deuteronomy. One does not live by bread alone, Deuteronomy 8, 3. Worship the Lord your God and serve only him, Deuteronomy 6, 13. Do not put the Lord your God to the test, Deuteronomy 6, 16. What Jesus believes in makes a difference in how he acts in this wilderness confrontation with evil. Jesus could have given himself personal exemptions from each and every temptation he was given. He could get bread while others starve. He could grab power while others remain at the mercy of powers and principalities. He could end all doubt, his or anyone else's, about who he was by making a public demonstration of God's favor for him on command. In the desert, Jesus could have drawn the line between the haves and the have-nots with him inside the side of the haves. Instead, his belief in who God was and who God was calling him to be in that moment led him to place himself with those on the outside of that line with those on the margins, with those who fear and doubt and hunger, with us. Friday night at our first gathering of Lenten House Church, I made a comment about, quote, redistricting privilege. I'm not sure if I heard that somewhere, if I made it up in the moment. I kind of like to think that I did. But the image I had in my mind was how often throughout history the pursuit of justice and peace has included moments when people who had been on the margins have drawn the new line of justice just wide enough that they were now included in it, but not any further. In that moment, I was thinking of white women winning the right to vote in 1920 at the exclusion of women of color who would have to wait another 45 years for the same right. In that moment, I was thinking of cisgender gay men who worked so hard for marriage equality by sacrificing and excluding our transgender siblings in the movement. And I was thinking of those in leadership positions in our church who are divorced or who are women 
who now, to this day, still work hard to exclude the GLBTQ plus community from ordination or leadership in this church. It seems that just about every time we have the chance to blow the windows wide open and let the Holy Spirit do her work, we forget what we profess to believe in and act out of the temptation to pay attention only to our own self-interests. Thank goodness Jesus shows us another way. Jesus, throughout his life and ministry, consistently draws the line of God's love and grace and mercy with all of humanity, all of God's children soundly inside of it. Where do we draw the line? What we believe in ought to inform how we act in response to that belief. The important question is to ask is not what do you believe, but what difference does it make that you believe? Does the world come nearer to the dream of God because of what you believe? Amen.